a special expert track um, for this um, for this conference, where we basically want to examine with experts from the industry particular themes in biotech-related markets. Um, so it's with pleasure that I uh, want to start with the first talk of today, and we have Kempen and Co. Um, for us speaking. There was uh, a slight change on the program, so. Um, Oscar is a boot is not able to attend, so we have uh, Frederick Goddard de Vries, vice president from Kempen and Co, uh, speaking for us, and Rem Colons. And the title of the workshop is "Everything You Wanted to Know About Capital Markets, But You Were Afraid to Ask." So, let's welcome our speakers and enjoy the talk. Okay, many thanks. Welcome to this session uh, on the La Biotech uh, Refresh event. Um, as said, called everything you wanted to know about the capital market but were afraid uh, to ask. Um, we are from uh, Kempe, which is a Dutch merchant bank, and so we think we are in a good position to tell you something about it. But let's make it an uh, interactive session. <laughs> and please ask uh, questions if you have them, uh, but we'll also schedule in some time uh, to answer it at uh, the end. Okay, I will just tell you something uh, about Kempen & Co, uh, who we are and why we are um, in this position to tell you something about the capital market. Then we'll guide you uh, and give you an introduction about the uh, life sciences capital market. Uh, next we will uh, tell you something about recent and less recent capital markets activity in the European uh, landscape. Um, we will present uh, two uh, case studies for you on uh, companies that made very good use of the capital markets and are good examples for younger startups uh, to look at. And uh, we will share some final thoughts with you on um, how we look at the capital markets and things that you should keep in mind uh, when considering going to the stock market. Kempen Co. is a uh, Dutch investment bank owned by the uh, Dutch private wealth manager uh, Valanschot, uh, who is listed on the uh, Dutch stock exchange with a market cap of about uh, a billion. We are um, within Kempen divided in a capital management, uh, in an asset, uh, asset management department, but also uh, with investment banking activities, which work on a, a fee basis mainly. Um, the investment banking division is again divided into uh, corporate finance and uh, securities. Remco and I are active in the uh, corporate finance division. Key activities of corporate finance are mergers and acquisitions, um, debt advisory, but also equity capital markets, which is again the linking pin to the securities department, which is on a whole different side uh, of the Chinese wall where we work. The public side, we work on the private side for, um, for issuers, for companies, and uh, securities on the public side doing sales and trading in, uh, in stock, but also writing equity research, um, having relationships with uh, investors, but all based on, uh, on public information. What distinguishes Kempen is our sector approach, and we have uh, chosen certain sectors from which life sciences is one, that all have one thing in common, they are quite capital intensive. Other sectors are Benelux corporates, real estate, but also fintech companies, um, which started about a year ago and are quite new, upcoming, not yet um, an industry that we, uh, I think, can, can see here today, but an industry that is coming with more and more VCs and also where we expect companies to go, uh, to go public um, for different, uh, different reasons. Um, Corp Finance is based in Amsterdam. Securities is based in Amsterdam, London, and New York, uh, with the main reason to be closer to our clients, um, which are based uh, over, uh, yeah, spread over the world. With Corp Finance, we have uh, in M&A a um, worldwide focus, and in ECM, we serve pan-European uh, the companies that are listed on the different stock exchanges in uh, the Netherlands. Um, what is our goal? What do we do in work? That is one simple thing that is deals. We can do uh, transactions in uh, mergers and acquisitions or in capital market deals. 
but it's all driven around deals. We executed in the last decade about 100 of them, and we think we can make a difference in how we do it and how we uh, get to a certain investor network for companies that want to go, uh, to go public. If you look at our team, we have a background um, ranging from uh, financial to very scientific people. Some have uh, MBAs, some have PhDs, and some are just uh, master. But we all share the same passion for the capital market and uh, the scientific um, that, uh, that brings life science companies uh, with it. Looking at the different uh, sectors that are, are represented by the life sciences industry, we uh, try to work with all from biotech to medical devices to spec pharma companies, but also to the more healthcare, home care focused companies. Although we are here today, I think more for the biotech and the diagnostics and the medical devices uh, companies. Coming back to uh, the clients that we serve is on the one hand the investors and on the other, on the other hand the uh, corporates, the issuers. Um, investors are spread over Europe and the US. Um, companies that we serve are based in Europe, um, if we were to talk about uh, capital market transactions, but also in the US if you, uh, or in, in uh, Asia if you talk about M&A transactions. Selected examples of companies that we work for are the German company Providerk, an Alzheimer company that went in um, Amsterdam to the stock exchange about uh, three years ago and after that did two times a, um, a sub-10 and 10% financing round uh, to raise additional uh, funding for their clinical trials. We also worked for Biocartis, brought them to the Brussels stock exchange and raised additional money after that. Um, Tygenix, the Belgium-Spanish company, uh, a merger with Celerix, um, Nanobiotics, and most recently for uh, Argenix, the Belgian company that went to the uh, NASDAQ uh, US stock exchange. We acted as advisor to uh, the company for them. In addition, uh, we have done work in M&A, uh, from which the most capital markets related one is, I think, the Dr. Reddy's offer uh, for the Dutch company uh, Octoplus, in which it was taken uh, public after being a listed company for about, uh, about 10 years. How do we see the European landscape? Um, there's a big difference between Europe and the US. In the US, there are two exchanges. You have the uh, NASDAQ and the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, NASDAQ more focused on the tech companies, but in the end, there are only two exchanges. Well, looking at Europe, as it is always the case for the European Union, there are many countries all having their own characteristics, having their own stock exchange and um, facilitating uh, to go public, but with their own characteristics. We try to uh, act in between. Um, we work for companies that are based uh, pan-European from the Nordics to uh, their southern countries and try to be the link between European investors and European companies, but also between US investors and European uh, companies. Looking at the different type of transactions that Kempen is working on, um, it all starts for a private company with its, uh, if you talk about the capital markets, with its IPO, its initial public offering, which can be on um, every uh, yeah, stock exchange, but all with their own uh, characteristics and types and, and reasons for uh, listing. May, most of the time, main reason being the country of incorporation. Um, in addition to IPOs, companies that are already listed uh, can do mainly two types of transactions. They can issue new shares, primary shares, or they can um, uh, sell secondary shares, so already existing shares, and that via different ways of, um, of selling it, being uh, book built offerings in which you try to sell a certain amount of shares to, a, to, to an investor public that wants to give the highest price for that, uh, but you can also do a block trade in which you sell a certain amount of shares to one other uh, investor, where our job will be to find that investor and to uh, match supply and demand. In the end, um, some companies do not uh, stay on the public uh, market anymore for different reasons. Uh, for example, the uh, Dutch company Octoplus, which I talked about, was taken private by Dr. Reddy's, uh, for which we acted as advisor to Dr. Reddy's, uh, because it's quite a difficult process to get a company um, delisted, as you need 
to get more than 95% of the shares tendered in your hands, and after that you can uh, fully consolidate it. And that is a whole process with timelines and regulatory uh, requirements to, uh, to do so. The other activities that we work on for companies are strategic advisory, um, but also M&A advisory, um, share buybacks, and other types of capital market uh, transactions. Okay, then I'll give you some more um, thoughts on the life sciences capital market. Assuming no questions yet. <laughs> Biotech is a very um, different sector from the traditional sectors. The traditional sectors we all know are companies like Unilever or Shell and are growing, um, if it all goes well, but are not growing very fast. Um, the value that they create is reflected by marginally increasing cash flows, all driven by operational improvements um, or acquisitions or other types of growth, but not with big chunks, uh, regulatory approvals like we see in uh, biotech. These markets have a very strong correlation with the bigger macroeconomic events, but also sector trends like the financial uh, crisis had on, uh, on banks, and in the end, all on profitability, how much cash is coming out of a company, um, maybe in profits, uh, but it can also be in uh, dividends. Companies are financed both in equity as well as in debt for the simple reason that they have cash flows and can therefore pay interest and amortization on their existing uh, debt products. The, the biotech sector, therefore, is very different. If you look at the um, share price increase uh, that Gendak made is almost 4,000% over the last five years. That is something that we will not see in the more traditional sectors and can only be realized by uh, making a successful product and uh, the subsequent or, or needed approvals for that. Everything that drives value is driven by product innovation. Um, and I think we all know that is why we are here uh, today to talk about it and the requirements that uh, come with that. Um, biotech companies have a very strong correlation with uh, product <coughs> development. It's all or success or not success or somewhere in between. Um, but if it's successful, then it can give very big spikes. And unfortunately, you can't see the spikes that Galapagos made in this graph, but they're also very large. And in the last couple of years, Galapagos grew from a 16 euro per share company to a almost 100 uh, share price a company. And so it's a very big achievement. And if you look at the IEX, the Dutch uh, uh, large cap index, it is all, uh, almost neglected what, uh, what happens there. You can also see when looking at the news, what happens to such companies that uh, Galapagos managed to become in the, uh, the, the main exchange, the, the, sorry, the main index, the IAX of Dutch, the large, large cap Dutch companies. So we're also uh, Unilever or Shell is in and Galapagos is almost every day in the news now. And that is not for the reason that they every day have uh, good or bad news, but it's more that the share price just fluctuates and jumps a lot. And they always have top performers and the worst performers. And Galapagos is almost every day one of them. What are the benefits of being a listed company? Um, we tried to write down some of them. The list is probably much longer. But the key things why you want to go to the uh, stock exchange is that it um, first validates and values your company. It provides you a validation of the work that you do, and people are willing to put a, a price on that. You will all the time see when you do something good and when you do something not so good. And um, and people will, um, uh, yeah, we, will share that with you by buying shares or selling shares, which will be reflected in the, uh, the share price of the company. Second reason, it offers you access to capital market, which is a very strong and deep source of capital. If you have a good so uh, story, then you can always uh, raise new money, be it with a good story or be it opportunistically by just saying, I, 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 I I, I, yeah, you know me, I have a good story, and I want to raise new capital. And Galapagos is also a very good example of that, who managed to raise 364 million in its, uh, in its latest offering on, uh, on NASDAQ without a real use of proceeds, saying, I'm going to use it for this. It's just 
people trust that they will spend the money, uh, the money in the right way and create value with that. Third reason, it enhances your company profile. You will become a publicly known company. You will have much more than only your website and uh, maybe some conferences where you will go to, but you will be in the news very regular. Um, retail investors will follow you and you will become a company that is written about on all developments that you make, which can also help you in the development of your product uh, that people know what you're working on. Um, next reason is, is, uh, is simply the cheapest source of capital. If you look at other types of financing, it's, it's almost always more expensive. VC financing, yeah, it's not carved in stone, but returns of about 25, 30% are, um, are quite common, where for biotech companies, it is very hard to calculate what in the end the cost of their capital is on the stock exchange, but it's more in the range of 10 to 15% uh, that investors in the end uh, require. It also gives you a market to, uh, way to incentivize uh, management and uh, employees as you always have a valuation and also in time you will have a value increase or decrease on which you can base option plans, warrants to incentivize your management and um, uh, align their, um, their, their pay with what the company does. Uh, another reason is it provides you a new currency to pay for acquisition. And I do not mean then a different currency in uh, which country it's from, but it gives you shares. And shares are a very attractive and strong tool to acquire companies, um, in essence, by just printing money. That if you have a good story and you want to acquire a company, that you do not need to have the, many, uh, the money on the bank to do so, but you can um, uh, say, I want to pay in my shares and issue shares in your company to acquire a new one. Um, where there are also examples we will get later to of companies that did that uh, very well. Um, another reason is it creates exit opportunities for existing shareholders. When you are a private company, VC funded, um, attracting new money is difficult, but it's even more difficult to get uh, an exit for existing shareholders. And in the end, VCs are financial investors and need to get out somehow. Well, then there are two ways. One is via trade sale in which you directly exit, or the other one is via a IPO in which uh, part of the shareholder base can exit, but um, then via the capital markets at the moment in time when you think I'm ready uh, to exit now as an investor. And last but not least, it gives you access to a new shareholder base, which is very important um, because in the end you need investors that, uh, that back you, that want to give you new money in times that you need it and support you in your growth of the company. They have to believe in your story and you can diversify by going to the uh, stock market as in the end people are then free to buy and sell shares and they will also, um, uh, you, will, you will attract as the company the right shareholders for your company um, as, it is, uh, as it is easy to, uh, to switch as, a, uh, as an existing shareholder. What are the requirements for a successful life sciences IPO? So the initial public offering when a company first go to the market, it is first of all, you need a good use of proceeds. What are you going to do with the uh, money that you will raise? And um, life science IPO is not like a traditional company that is going to the uh, stock market, which can also maybe use um, or, or raise no new money, but only facilitate an exit for existing shareholders payback debt, but it will all not be the case for um, life science companies simply because there is no debt and if an existing shareholder will sell, that will per definition be uh, not a very good signal um, because that simply means that they do not believe in the story anymore and um, the company will definitely need new money for its, uh, its product development. So upfront, make sure that you have enough money to reach a certain value inflection point, be it a regulatory decision or something else that will lead to an increase or decrease of your uh, stock price. Second thing is commercial potential. Companies that go to the stock market um, will need to have more than only a good product or a nice publication or a story that we think we can make a lot of money with this. They really need to have a product that will have significant market potential, 
not necessarily a very big market, can also be an orphan market with uh, less um, players in there, but um, uh, in the end, the company needs to be able to have uh, a revenue, and, and peak market revenue of about 200, 300, 400 million to go to the, uh, to the stock market. Second thing that is very important, or third thing, uh, are pre-commitments. Pre-commitments are um, commitments from existing or from new shareholders that say, I will chip in in this IPO, and I will make upfront known to the public that I will do so. Um, by publishing this in the prospectus. It can be in different forms, it can be harder and softer, but preferably it will be stated in the, uh, in the listing prospectus that uh, an, an, uh, a certain shareholder will put money in, which will give a validation that already one person or more who had a very good look at the company is willing to uh, put in more money. Um, this can go up to 90%, but um, a little less is, uh, is common. But, External validation is one that is very important to, um, uh, to show that you as a company not only have worked out of university, but you have um, gone out, you have talked with people, you have closed collaborations, you have key opinion leaders that support your story, and um, you also have a management that maybe have, has done it before, of, or people in the management have done it before. And um, uh, of course, you always will need the scientific backing, uh, peer review journals, and people really need to have a look at the science. Um, investors are more knowledgeable than you would, uh, would think. Um, next one is a very strong news flow. You will need to create um, uh, moments in time where there will be a, uh, uh, an, uh, a press release stating something big. And if you have a very uh, big item that cannot take three or four years, investors will not wait for that. It will be too long. Life science investors do have a long horizon, much longer than, uh, than, than other type of investors on the uh, public market. But they will not wait three or four years, but they want to see how the development is going. Um, so you have to think about how can I do that? Can I do an open label tribal? Can I maybe do uh, two different uh, products in development where the first development will come sooner than the other one? The one maybe only in phase one, which will take shorter, and the other one in uh, phase three, we will have much longer development times. Uh, season management is one that is, um, in, uh, as a startup, as a VC company, very important, but it will continue also as a public listed company, be it that it might be a slightly different uh, management, because the management has to uh, fulfill different roles than in a VC company. VC is more focused on uh, the development of the product in the early days. Later on, there comes a whole new job by educating, informing, and keeping the market up to date on why and what you are doing with, uh, with their money. Um, also applicable to VC companies, but it's not really about the product, but there are three reasons to invest sometimes, and that is uh, management, management, and management. And you can change from product, but you cannot very simply change from management that has wasted all your, uh, your money. And then last but not least is the clear route to value creation. You have to make clear in your presentation, in your prospectus, what will the path to, um, um, to getting certain approvals and certain milestones that the investors can check what you will do and they also can have their um, uh, opinion about it and agree on it or not. They will need to know everything that you are going to do and need to agree on it when they are, will decide to, uh, to invest. A life science IPO has always been a financing event. A decade ago, and still, in a life science IPO, you always raise new money to fund new clinical trials or other types of development. This has not changed over time, and I think will always stay the same. Other characteristics did change over time. In the past, like a decade ago, it was possible to invest in science, to invest in a platform that may have good technology, but where you believe in. Currently, investors are looking at a business. What are the products that I'm investing in? What is the pipeline? What is the management like? And do I think this will get to um, a product that will be approved? Proof of concept, um, ask, answering the question, is the technology innovative enough, was 
in the early days enough to get investors um, uh, warm for your story. Currently, investors want to see proof of relevance. Is this a product that patients are going to use, that payers are going to pay for, and that can come to the market and uh, give me enough revenues and in the end profits to pay back my investment um, in uh, different ways uh, possible. The third thing that was different in the past is uh, blockbusters, mainly coming also from the big pharma companies. Uh, Biotech also more focused on that and the big shift that is now ongoing um, from blockbusters more to niche busters, companies that are more focusing on smaller indications, orphan indications, but also on subgroup uh, indications of bigger indications are uh, liked by investors and um, uh, companies can go public on only a smaller indication and not the biggest market where you will have a multi-billion dollar um, revenue uh, potential. The At what stage are companies entering the capital markets? Um, it depends. It is most of the time phase one or phase two currently, where in the past companies were able to go to the stock market at very low or relatively low, if you look at uh, the days uh, or, or nowadays, uh, valuations, um, mentioning Galapagos, but also uh, Octoplus, with a pre-money valuation of only 40 uh, to, to 50 million. And on top of that, then, 20 million raise, giving it an initial market cap of about 60 million. Currently, you don't see that anymore, with as main reason that those companies were still in preclinical development. Currently, companies need to be in phase one. Um, investors even preferably see phase two companies, um, also leading them to valuations that are higher in the 100 million post money, so after you raise the money and put that on top of the uh, value, valuation, um, for the reason also that investors have problems investing in smaller companies, they cannot do that out of uh, reasons, uh, out of fund reasons, but also that smaller companies get more illiquid and then it becomes more difficult to get out of stock, so they prefer to have it a big bigger where Europe is not very big. In the US, it is even bigger. You have to have some substantial mass of about 300, 400, 500 million before you should go, companies also go for lower, but should go to the uh, stock market. And in Europe, it is more, it's possible to get at a lower uh, valuation uh, already. Okay, then uh, Remco will tell you something about uh, recent uh, and less recent capital markets activity. And uh, I will get back later. All right, thank you. I'll stand over here if you don't mind. All right, so what has happened? Uh, let me see how this works. Oh, next one. So, what has happened in uh, capital markets over the last 10 years? So I think this graph is probably recognizable for anyone who's ever looked at stock markets. Uh, markets go up, markets go down, uh, share prices go up, share prices go down. And you tend to see that in times where share prices are high, then more uh, potential companies want to go to the market, which is obvious if you only want to sell your company if uh, shareholders are willing to pay a higher price. Uh, and you see here that uh, in the good years, so around, uh, so just after the, uh, uh, just before the uh, dot-com bubble, about 40 companies a year went public. And again, you saw that in uh, 2004, five, and then most recently also, I, th I think uh, 14, 15, 16, there were about uh, 40 to 45 companies going public every year. And uh, in 2017, we now have uh, about uh, 10 companies. So let's see how many uh, companies go uh, uh, in the second phase. But uh, the, the macroeconomic factors are looking good. Technical issue. Nope. There it is again, which is the next slide. Um, yeah, so let me quickly go back to the previous slide. Yeah, so as, as you can see here, these are the companies that went public during that time. Uh, in Europe, uh, this is just a selection, but on average about 40 to 45 companies a year in good years, uh, and then in, in uh, not so good years, so less, only the really good companies went public in, uh, in bad years. Um, so pre-commitments, um, we mentioned this before, it's very important to get some good pre-commitments for a successful IPO. Uh, why is that? Well, if, as a new investor, uh, if I look at a new company and the current investors are all exiting and all these investors probably have some knowledge of the company, then 
I'd be a bit fearful to invest in something where everybody's exiting. So if you, so, invest, so current investors generally don't exit at that point as a sort of a signaling approach. Then the next step to that is if investors really believe this is good, why don't you put extra money in it? And that's what happens very often. Uh, current investors, as long as they can and have the money for it, they invest additionally uh, in the IPO to go for the next round and then exit only later. So the more successful IPOs in general, I would say, are those that are uh, supported by its current investors uh, as a signaling event to new investors, showing confidence in the product, confidence in management, uh, and confidence in the market. So something else that we've seen, I think everybody knows, is that U.S. has a lot of uh, has a lot of investors, deep pockets. Um, the reason why not everybody goes to the U.S. immediately is because you have to be a bit bigger. Um, in Europe, you can be about say, 50 million raised, 200 billion uh, market cap. Uh, in Europe, in the uh, U.S., you have to be twice as big. So for smaller European companies, you tend to see that they go to Europe first, and then maybe later to Nasdaq. Uh, but still, there's a lot of U.S. participation. Um, also in uh, in uh, again, not working. Yeah. Right, so again, uh, you don't need to say the slide to understand. Uh, there's a lot of US participation also in European uh, transactions. And we really recommend, if you go to the market, to also get your investors in, US investors in, because that allows you to have sort of uh, traction with US, US investors before you go to the US in a few years down the line. So if you now market already your European shares, uh, in a few years you go to NASDAQ for your second listing, and then you already know the investors, and they know the product, they know the management. It makes it a lot easier to raise money in the end. Uh, and U.S. investors are interested in doing that, and you see that, uh, well, you see that across the line. There's a lot of uh, pre-commitment on average. I would say about half of the European offerings are, are currently um, from U.S. investors. So, case studies. Uh, we've, we've selected two companies, and, and the best companies to show are generally the ones that, uh, that do best. Um, and these uh, are companies that we know quite well. Uh, Galapagos, we, uh, well, not I personally, but our team has brought to the market in 2005 uh, at a valuation of, I think, 50 million-ish, uh, 20 million raise, something like that, which is fairly little, even for biotech standards. Uh, it was a difficult IPO to pull off. Not a lot of investors were convinced of this story. Um, what well you can see from the line that if you were convinced at that point at a valuation of uh, well, with 60 million, and it's currently 4 billion, you can imagine you've made uh, quite a bit of money. Um, but the strategy here is more interesting. How did Galapagos do that? Um, it started out as a fee-for-services business. Uh, they started by just building and acquiring small businesses that did fee-for-services for other biotechs, and they used their uh, market, their, their stock listing, to do that. So they acquired a lot of companies through shares uh, and the cash they generated from this fee-for-services business, and thereby growing uh, uh, tremendously, but also taking up the development risk from this fee-for-services business. So, uh, so in the end, they started taking more and more risk, and at some point they had business development, uh, making good products, and then they shifted towards fully having a risky organization, a riskful organization, they sold the, risk, the, the fee for business and services, and they developed their own product. And that's where the real uh, hit came in. And this was here. That's where they decided to do that. They sold the services business. They started developing product, which was the point where they were interested enough to go, interesting enough to go to the U.S. And there you see the big, uh, big uh, increases towards uh, four billion, which it is uh, today. But the interesting part is that going through the stock market to use shares to acquire to execute on, your execute on your strategy and thereby growing uh, extensively. And something similar we've seen with, uh, with the next companies is Shire, uh, also a very existive company, uh, having done 33 acquisitions over the years and thereby growing extremely fast. Uh, and here I think the growth rate is especially interesting, 65% per year, uh, which again, I wouldn't get on my savings account, um, and all through acquisitions and a lot through either the cash that they made on the fees for services business or uh, using shares uh, as, as you are on the, on the stock exchange. So last, last interesting element we've seen, um, we've seen quite a few companies going to the market or uh, announcing that they want to go to the market and then being acquired just before they were intending to go to the market. 
um, at a significantly higher valuation. So uh, this is a trend, or at least we've seen it a few times. I don't know if it's uh, early enough to call it a trend, but uh, we've definitely seen it. And it's, for us as advisors in IPO, a bit worrying. But as an investor, uh, before IPO, it's obviously very, uh, very happy to have this. Um, Symmetris is an example where they wanted to go to the stock exchange. Uh, in 2015, it was too difficult. They couldn't get the money out. Uh, fairly limited valuation, 200 million. Uh, looking to raise about 80 million uh, Swiss franc. Um, and failing to do so, two years later in a better market, or at least they thought it was a better market, uh, uh, going again, uh, a little bit less uh, euro amount this time, but 10 days after announcing to go to, public, to the market, uh, they were acquired for, let's see, a significantly higher amount than they were going to, uh, to the market. So the question here is why, why are, willing, are corporates willing to pay so much more than public investors? I, if you have the answer, I'd be happy to hear it. Uh, we're not completely sure, but I guess invest, public and market investors are a bit more uh, reluctant to pay these high, uh, high numbers. Um, a more extreme example is Ojeda. Uh, Ojeda is a Belgian company in women's health. This uh, company is fairly close to me, and I feel a bit sad to have to tell you this. Uh, we were um, fairly close to this IPO. Uh, they were intending to go to the market at a valuation of anywhere between 200 and, million, uh, and 300. Um, and while the banks were diligently working on this process, uh, they were acquired for a valuation which is three times as big, or three times as big as they were going to go to the market, which is great for investors, uh, as for VC investors, uh, but unfortunately public market investors were not able to invest in this, and um, it ended up not going to the market. So some final thoughts from Frederick. Final thoughts on uh, okay, for the box then. <laughs> so, final, final thoughts on um, the relationship we have with our investors. We do every year a, a survey amongst our investor uh, groups, and uh, that's around uh, 100 people that we um, uh, or an external company uh, ask every year the same questions on how they look at the market and what are the companies that say are uh, most likely to uh, to invest in. What do we uh, want to invest in and um, what are trends that we are spotting? Well, that enabled us to come up with a picture showing what is the perfect company to invest in at the moment. So companies can uh, not work towards that, but at least they can see in uh, what way they fit. The perfect company has a product that is in phase two or later. Like I said before, phase one or even preclinical is perceived as too early. Phase one will be possible, but preclinical, uh, I can say, will become very, very difficult. Um, if you look at the different uh, subsectors, then biotech is the most preferred ones, um, with the main reason, I think, that the returns are the highest in this sector compared to diagnostics or maybe pharma companies. Oncology is, for years, already for years, the most interesting field uh, investors that uh, are looking at. And when investing, then they want to see a cash runway of over 12 months. So the preferred investment target for public investors are biotech companies with an oncology drug in phase two and a cash runway of at least 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I would like to share some thoughts with you on uh, how we as a merchant bank look at the capital markets. And um, we try to put it in some wording uh, to make it understandable for, uh, for everyone and to remember it in the right way. Well, first one is from uh, just a quote from Thomas Edison. Opportunity is missed by most because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Saying, very simple, it is a hard process and it's hard work to get to the stock market and maybe even harder, the life after words. Directly relates to the road that you see on the next picture, um, saying it is really not the listing that matters, but it's about the journey thereafter. People work towards an IPO, but the IPO is just the initial step, the birth in your life of a public company, and the real journey will start thereafter, but a, a listing will give you ample opportunities to raise new cash, to do acquisitions via shares, or all other types of capital market transactions that will allow you to do, uh, to do big things. Third one on the cookies is um, related to a lot of companies, but uh, the one I told before, also Galapagos. 
um, who did it most recently in its uh, 364 million offering on NASDAQ, but also in the early days in 27, 28, when they were still a young company. The management had so much belief, or the investor community had so much belief in the management that they were able to raise capital without a real good use of proceeds. Opportunistically, we can say. So we say when they serve cookies, you eat cookies. And this will allow you to bring your company forward in good times of the market, but also in bad times when it is simply not able or not possible to raise, uh, to raise new money. The fourth one is the news. In absence of cash flow, which is the case for all biotech companies, you just need news flow. And you can achieve the same thing with news as you can with cash, but you need to educate and get your investors known about what you are doing in your company and uh, what is happening. And that will, in the end, drive valuation very clearly. Last one is on, um, uh, on the nation and its leader. Every company gets the shareholder base it deserves. You as a company can have a certain shareholder base when you will go to the stock market. But this will definitely change over time if you become a different company. And the shareholders, will, good shareholders will invest in a good company and less good investors or different types of investors will invest in less good companies. But if you do right, then you will attract the right investor base and make it possible to get US investors in, to get uh, the best European investors in and to build a relationship with long-term investors that fully commit to your growth and your story and make it possible to uh, raise enough, um, enough cash to grow to the new uh, GenMap or Galapagos or whatever company you want to uh, say. Okay, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Thank, uh, thank you very much uh, to Kempen and Kung for the nice insights in, about the capital market. Are there any questions? Hi, thank you. Very interesting, very uh, true, I think. There's one question, though. Do you need an IPO listing in the US to get US investors? Yes. Right. Could you, would you like to uh, divest on that a bit? So how do you go about the US investors not having a US listing? You can see we only have one microphone, so I think we have we shown one picture on um, how Kempa works and how Kempa works with uh, European-based companies, and we bring them to the market. Wait, let me to the European uh, to the European stock market, and we have done not only IPOs but also several uh, follow-on transactions which are shown from right to left in chronological order. And you see that about half of the investors are coming from the US. We do that via an, uh, it's called 144A license, in which we as a uh, European bank are able to, um, to attract US investors to invest in an, uh, in an, an um, European company. Um, you will not be able to get all US investors in. There will certainly be certain groups or certain investors that can only invest in the US in US stocks. So then you will need to do a US IPO, have ADS. But that group, um, yeah, we, we never solve problems with. And at most of the uh, investors are able to invest as well in ordinary shares in Europe, as well as in uh, ADSs or in, uh, in US shares. So I think the clear answer is it does not make a difference. And US fans, investors will find the nice companies also when they're based in, uh, in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, so your last point was like uh, every company gets the shareholders it deserves. Um, I've seen a lot of smaller companies starting to get investment from uh, wealth sovereign funds and high net worth individuals rather than going through IPOs. Um, is that a, something that you've seen as a trend recently in terms of high value deals or is going public the, uh, I guess, the mainstream way of raising capital to get past phase two? I think a big difference is that uh, high net worth individuals are high net worth, and they most of the time do have then a lot of, uh, of money. But funding a real phase three trial in a big indication is just uh, too much, and you can't fund that on your, uh, on your own. So you will need 
different group of investors and deeper pockets. And in the end, the public markets are the deepest, deepest source of capital that you can, uh, can access. Um, but of course, there will also be high net worth individuals interested to fund companies. But I think it will be more in an early stage, although you did see a small trend of bigger private financings in the last couple of, uh, of years. Thank you for the talk. Uh, actually, I want to know, like, oncology is most preferred, like, on like, yeah? Oncology products, they are the most preferred by the investors. What are the, your views on Alzheimer's? Like, uh, if a company is in medical diagnostics for Alzheimer's, phase two, clinical trials. So, yeah, medical diagnostics for Alzheimer's disease in phase two. So do you think is it a, is a right option to put money in or? To put money in, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. But uh, Alzheimer's has uh, yeah, different characteristics. It's just a field of a lot of failures and, uh, and not, not that many successes yet. But there are companies active in it, like, uh, like the German company Probiotrug, um, which will come out with results in the, in the near term. Um, so maybe that uh, it can be a good one. But the returns perspective for biotech are higher than for diagnostics. And that is, I think, the main reason that uh, investors are more willing to invest in, uh, in biotech than in uh, diagnostics companies. But there are always exceptions. <laughs> um, can you elaborate a bit about the phenotype of the investors in European IPOs? I mean, in the US you see a couple of names recurring in many of the IPOs. In Europe that's not necessarily the case. Um, who are those investors? How do they look like and are there any trends? Um, yeah, you, uh, Dutch or, or the European investor base that we have uh, consists of the more VC funds that also invest in public companies, and we have the purely uh, uh, life science focused investors, um, like uh, uh, yeah, the names that are on the list: Royola, Polar, um, Acecap is a new fund that is coming up, um, and you have some more optimistically driven investors like uh, like Nijenburg. The real Trends, I find hard to say which, what, what are those. I should have a discussion with the, uh, the older department in, uh, in equity research. Um, but I think they are yeah, similar, to looking to similar companies as the US, uh, the US ones. And um, trends, difference in trends between those two geographies, I have to look further into the survey, but they probably exist, yeah. <laughs> U.S. is much more, sp yeah, if you mean that, yeah. U.S. is much more specialist than uh, European. That is certainly, uh, certainly true. And the knowledge that is available in the U.S. F uh, is much better than in the uh, European uh, investor base. That, um, yeah, that's the. Any further question from the audience? Otherwise. Thank you so much, uh, Kempen and Co. once again, and let us everybody enjoy the coffee break, and see you at the next session at 11.50 for the expert break. Thank you so much. <laughs>